This video is sponsored by Wondrium. Hello and welcome to this episode of Night Sky News for March 2022 with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. This is the series where we chat about what you should look out for in the night sky in the next few weeks and then we chat about what's been happening in space news in the past few weeks. There's chapter titles down here if you want to skip ahead to any specific news story and any scientific papers I mentioned are going to be linked in the video description down below free to read. Also a big thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring this video, more on their educational video subscription service later. Without any further ado, let's kick things off and start by looking up. All right, so we've just had the vernal equinox, which has heralded the official arrival of astronomical spring here in the Northern Hemisphere and autumn in the Southern Hemisphere. So we're sort of, us Northerners are like passing the baton down to all of you in the South now, because as the days get longer, obviously the nights get shorter, they also get more humid as well. And eventually we're not gonna have the ideal sort of stargazing conditions up here, but down South, obviously going into winter, critically cold nights, you definitely will. But wherever you are in the world right now, around the vernal equinox is one of the perfect times to get out and stargaze, especially because you can see the winter constellations like Orion in the evening sky. And then in the morning sky, you can see summer constellations like Cygnus and the square of Pegasus. So it's like the best of both worlds. And there is an extra special excuse for all of us to get up early at the minute. And that is because there are a load of planets visible in the morning sky. So you've got Venus, Mars, and Saturn all visible during the latter half of March, sort of clustered together in a triangle together with the crescent moon or the toenail moon, as I call it, joining them around the 27th or the 28th of March. This is going to be easier to spot the further south you are, as they'll be much higher in the sky. But those of us in the UK, we're going to struggle because they're going to be right down on the horizon. They'll obviously keep moving in their orbit, so keep an eye on their changing positions, like day after day, if you're up early with clear skies. Look out, especially on the 4th and 5th of April, when Saturn and Mars will come incredibly close to each other. Again, if you're far enough south, you should then also be able to spot the incredibly bright Jupiter joining them by early to mid-April, really highlighting what we call the ecliptic, right? We can see them all lined up in the sky, just showing once again how the solar system is this flat disk. If you decide to make a night of it or a morning of it stargazing, then make sure you keep your eyes peeled for shooting stars as well, meteors, because the annual Lyrids meteor shower is going to be peaking around about the 22nd, 23rd of April. So in the run up to that, you should also see some as well. And of course, always check whether the International Space Station is going to be passing overhead for you. I'll pop a link in the description so you can check for wherever you are in the world. All right, that's enough of looking up at the wonders of the night sky. Let's come back down to earth and chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. Okay, let's start with the good news, the very good news, and that is that the mirror alignment for the James Webb Space Telescope for one of its instruments is now complete, and it is operating at the peak of what is possible given the laws of physics. Last week, NASA released this image of a star that is far too faint for us even to be able to see with our own eyes to show that the mirror alignment process to bring the telescope's view into crystal clear sharp focus was now complete, at least for one of the detectors on board, the NearCam instrument, Webb's main imaging sensor that will be used to take images like this. I got very excited on a live stream about this at the end of a very frantic work day where I was actually putting in my own proposals to use not the J James Webb Space Telescope, but instead proposed to use the Hubble Space Telescope and the Very Large Telescope. The deadline is the same day, so you can imagine it's very frantic in the community right now. And in my frazzled, excited state covering all the basics, I missed explaining a couple of things about this image that some of you have since asked on social media. So let's do this with a little bit more detail, and hopefully a little bit more coherently as well. So the main reason that people were so excited about this image that was released was because it was like a proof of concept for what the James Webb Space Telescope could do in terms terms of the resolution it could achieve. So when we talk about resolution, angular resolution, we're talking about what's the smallest thing that the telescope can actually make out on the sky. So the sky is 360 degrees all the way around, right? And an object will take up some fraction of that 360 degrees. So for example, the moon, if you draw a line from the edge of this side of the moon to you and the edge of that side of the moon to you, then you would find that the angle it covered in the sky was about half a degrees, right? 
Okay. This image released by NASA showed that the resolution was 70 milli arc seconds, a wavelength of two microns, down in the infrared regime where James Webb detects light. That means it can pick out objects in the sky that are only 0.00002 degrees across. And that is the absolute physical peak of what is possible at that wavelength of two microns in the infrared. It's what's known as diffraction limited. So when waves like light waves pass through a small opening, they get bent. You might have actually seen this like at the coast with waves on the sea coming into a cove. The same thing happens with light. If you pass it through a, like a circular hole, you get this very distinctive pattern caused by the light waves interfering with themselves. So when you say something is diffraction limited, what you're saying is our objects far enough apart that you can pick out the two main peaks from this diffraction pattern or do they blur together? Now, the thing is the limit of that resolution you can achieve is dependent on both the wavelength of light that you're looking at and also the size of the telescope that's collecting that light. The equation to work it out is 1.22 times the wavelength divided by the diameter of the telescope. That'll give you the resolution in radians. So if you plug in these numbers for the James Webb Space Telescope, we get 1.22 times two microns divided by 6.5 meters, which is 3.75 times 10 to the minus seven radians or 77 milli arc seconds, an arc second being 3,600th of a degree. Now, because this resolution is dependent on wavelength and because the James Webb Space Telescope detects longer wavelengths in the infrared than the Hubble Space Telescope does in the optical, the visible light range that we see in, the eagle-eyed amongst you noticed that this is actually lower than the quoted resolution for Hubble of 40 milli arc seconds at around about 500 nanometers in the middle of sort of the visible wavelength range. But JWST does have quite a large large wavelength range. So it won't just look at two microns. It's actually going to go down to about 600 nanometers or 0.6 microns down in sort of like the visible wavelength regime around about sort of like orange colors sort of overlapping with Hubble just that little bit. And there it'll actually be able to achieve 20 milli arc seconds in resolution, which is less than the Hubble Space Telescope at those comparable wavelengths in the visible light regime, which is expected because James Webb is a much bigger telescope and the resolution depends on the size of your telescope. So yes, of course, at comparable wavelengths, James Webb is going to do better. But up in the infrared, where you've got these longer wavelengths, it's not going to be quite as good as Hubble, but it's still going to be working at the maximum that is physically possible, thanks to diffraction. It is, however, 28 times better resolution than the Spitzer Space Telescope, which also looked in the infrared and had a resolution upward of anywhere from like two arc seconds. I loved this comparison on Twitter, just flicking back and forth between the same patch of sky seen by Spitzer and seen by James Webb. I mean, the detail is just unreal. Just turning those fuzzy blobs into something beautiful. I mean, it's worth reminding ourselves that this is just a calibration image, right? You know, it was planned as part of the calibration process to double check the focusing and the alignment. You know, it's a couple of exposures of around about 400 to 500 seconds long all stacked together. And yeah, despite that, it could still pass as like a, like a deep field image that would take up for like six months to collect enough light to see, right? I mean, I think that just in itself, the number of galaxies you see in the background, the level of detail in revealing their shape just really highlights how transformative formative JWST is going to be. Now, the next big question people had about this image was why does the star have these eight spikes, right? Six main ones all separated exactly by 60 degrees and then these two horizontal ones as well. So remember I was talking before about that distinct pattern that you get when light passes through a small opening. Well, these sort of spikes that you see is essentially that. It's light diffracting through JWST sort of optical setup. So the pattern I showed before is actually what you get for a circular hole, which is what we see with Hubble, right? It has a circular mirror. But James Webb has both a hexagonal shaped mirror and one that is segmented as well. It's not one solid piece. So if you take all that into account, you end up with this six pointed star pattern. If you also include the fact that you've got this secondary mirror on this big long tripod that the light has to reflect off the, the primary mirror down to the secondary and then to the detectors, and it's sort of hanging around in front of the main mirror of the telescope, 
then you also get these horizontal lines added to that pattern too. This is something that's really well understood. You know, we've known how light has behaved for centuries, even in terms of like reflection and diffraction. So that image I actually showed of this, you know, very distinctive shape was actually from a paper back in 2007 during like the planning stages of the James Webb Space Telescope. So every single object in this image actually does also have this distinctive pattern, the stars and all the galaxies. It's really apparent, especially for this fainter star in the top right up here as well. The star it focused on though is so bright that it saturated the detector in the middle there and the light has bled into the neighboring pixels along these spikes. Again, we do see this with the Hubble Space Telescope, but it's just in this different characteristic pattern, this different shape of the spikes as well. And we see four of them because Hubble has a round mirror and an optic setup and everything like that. So from now on with like every new image that comes back down off the James Webb Space Telescope, we're gonna have to get used to seeing this really distinctive, like characteristic eight diffraction spike shape on all of the bright objects in, in the fields that it looks at. You know, I think it's gonna be sort of like the hallmark of a James Webb Space Telescope image. You're gonna be able to tell straight away if it's been taken by Webb, if it has that distinctive shape or not. But I was thinking that's like job done for the, the web team. Now they've obviously only aligned the telescope for one of the four detectors that are actually on board the telescope. They're now gonna spend the next six weeks essentially making sure the alignment is right for all of the other three detectors as well. Sort of finding like the best compromise for all of the detectors. Because the way James Webb works, it's not like, um, like a ground-based telescope that you'd actually have access to the telescope to, that if you wanted to switch between say an imaging detector that just, you know, straight records a light and takes an image compared to like a, what we call a spectrograph, which instead of, you know, recording an image, it takes the light, splits it into its component wavelengths and, and it gives you like a graph of how much light of each wavelength or color that you've received. If you wanted to switch between those modes, you could fully, you know, unscrew, <laughs> you wouldn't have to unscrew is probably the wrong word, but you, you know, you would take off one detector and replace it with the other. You might repoint and refocus your telescope. JWST can't do that though, because all four detectors actually view the sky at the same time. It has this big field of view, but each detector gets fed light from a specific part of that view that it's seeing. So it means that if someone has asked for time on, say, NearCam, the imager, to look at a specific galaxy in sort of one part of the sky, we actually get bonus observations of all of these other parts of the sky too, with the spectrograph or with another imager as well, which massively increases the value and like the efficiency of the data that Webb takes. So as I said, that process is gonna take about six weeks. They're gonna leave the Miri detector till last because they still need it to cool from around about 90 Kelvin down to seven Kelvin because it looks in the really far infrared at much longer wavelengths than all of the other detectors and needs it much colder to make sure there's not as much noise. That's the instrument that Dr. Sarah Kendrew is working on. If you wanna watch that chat I had with her last summer as well to hear more about that. So the alignment should be finished by early May or so. And then you've got two months of, you know, actual like commissioning and calibration of all the, the detectors, the actual instruments that will record the light as well. And then finally, hopefully by early July, we should actually have the very first like image, like proper science image coming down from the James Webb Space Telescope. And that would be just in time for the National Astronomy Meeting in Warwick in the UK, you know, like the professional conference where we all get together to share our research that we've been doing for the past year. You know, we've essentially got like 800 astronomers in one building and we haven't had it in person for years because of COVID either. And if the James Webb Space Telescope's first science images get released, in that week, can you imagine the atmosphere at that conference? Like as much as I'm like, oh, I wish we would just be able to take science images now. I want to start seeing it now. Part of me is like, I really hope it comes out that week because that would be incredible. Yeah. All right, time for the bad news now. And that is the planned launch of the European Space Agency's ExoMars mission carrying the Rosalind Franklin rover has been suspended. It was due to launch in the Mars launch window at the end of September 2022 on a Proton rocket run by Roscosmos and using a lander to bring the rover down to the surface that was designed by Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, and therein lies the problem. ExoMars has always been a joint collaboration between the European Space Agency and the Russian space agency Roscosmos, but ESA is fully aligned with the sanctions imposed on Russia by its member states. 
the unprovoked invasion of the sovereign nation of Ukraine by Russia and the resulting loss of life due to the ongoing attacks is abhorrent. So yes, the suspension of ExoMars is way down on the list of priorities that people care about right now, but I think it just goes to show you the, the far-reaching impacts that this war is having. You know, it's starting to affect scientific advancement, scientific collaboration, and also space exploration as well. So it could be that because the next launch window to Mars is now not until 2024, if we miss the September 2022 deadline, it could be that the, the European Space Agency team working on the ExoMars rover actually designs it to launch in a completely different rocket and even has to, from scratch, design a whole new lander that can take the Rosalind Franklin rover down to the surface of Mars as well. So it seems as if ExoMars is sort of the first scientific casualty of this war. But there are also many questions over the safety of the International Space Station too, which is another global space collaboration with Russia as a major partner. I don't think anybody really knows what's going to happen right now, but time, I'm sure, will tell. Okay, let's leave the messy, depressing, illogical world of human politics behind and chat science about black holes, specifically whether black holes are hairy <laughs> or not. So, so many of you sent me on social media, the media write-up of this paper, Quantum Hair from Gravity by Kalma and Collaborators, which claims that on tiny quantum scales, at least, black holes are hairy. Now, don't mean hair in the literal sense, this is a metaphor, and to understand it, we're going to have to go all the way back to the 60s, as so the work of Werner Israel, whose life's work was on understanding black holes theoretically, before even black holes had been observed, you know, and accepted as real objects. And what he did was he showed that for all the solutions to Einstein's theory of general relativity in the case of a black hole, they could only be described by three things that you could actually measure. So the mass of the black hole, the electric charge of the black hole, and the spin of the black hole, and what direction it's spinning and, and how fast. Every other single piece of information about the matter that then collapsed to form that black hole is lost beyond the event horizon, that point of no return where you'd have to be traveling faster than the speed of light, which isn't possible so nothing can escape. So hair is a metaphor for all of that extra information. Essentially, black holes are bald, right? And apparently we have physicists Jakob Bekenstein and John Wheeler for popularizing the phrase and for, you know, maybe confusing people all around the world. But think of it like this. Think about like two stars that are about to collapse into a black hole. The no hair theorem states that you can't tell if the star was made of pure hydrogen before it collapsed into the black hole, or if it had some amount of oxygen or nitrogen in there as well. All of that information about what the matter was, what element it was, is completely lost behind the event horizon. Or instead, you know, you can think of it as like, we don't know, for example, if the, the matter that collapsed to form this black hole was normal matter, whether it's antimatter or whether it's dark matter even. All of that information is lost. All we can measure about these bold black holes is mass, charge and spin. But Stephen Hawking pointed out though that this idea is massively at odds with what quantum physics tells us. The information should be conserved in the same way that energy should be conserved. You can't create or destroy energy. You, know, you can't create or destroy the information about particles that make up the matter that went down into the black hole. And so he said that this was a paradox that had to be resolved. Either there was something wrong with either general relativity or quantum physics, two huge pillars propping up a lot of what we know about in physics. Now that could be the case, it would be a very scary case, it would be a very exciting case because it would mean we'd learn a load more new physics if something was wrong. But every time we've gone out and tested these two theories, all of our observations have matched the predictions that they've made. So we're pretty confident in both general relativity and quantum physics. And yet clearly there is still a paradox here. What this paper by Kalma and collaborators have done is apparently resolve that paradox. They said it's not a paradox at all because according to them, black holes are not bald. They do have some hair, some information that is retained, at least on these tiny quantum scales. And 
quantum five o'clock shadow, if you will. Some tiny quantum stubble just poking through. Do you guys just put the word quantum in front of everything? They actually ran through all the equations and the mass and the theory to show that the information on, you know, what matter actually made up that black hole, what matter collapsed down into it, should actually leave a faint imprint on the pull of gravity that the black hole exerts on the objects around it. So if a star made of pure hydrogen collapses down into a black hole versus one that's got some carbon or some oxygen or some nitrogen in there as well, and that collapses down into a black hole, there'd be some very subtle differences on the effect effects they have on their surroundings. So how light or, or hydrogen gas moves around that black hole afterwards because there'd be very subtle differences in where the event horizon of that black hole would actually end up. The key word though there is subtle. The differences in that position of the event horizon would be so teeny, teeny tiny that we would never actually be able to observe, like with the telescope, those differences. Which for me, as an observer who actually does use telescopes to study black holes and their effects, is the key thing here. You know, maths and equations are great, and there have been many instances in science history where, you know, the maths has predicted something that we haven't observed yet, that we didn't know was there. But the fact that these differences are so tiny and we're not going to actually be able to test it is so infuriating. Of course, the theoretical physicists have other focuses. The discussion section of the paper actually ends with this. While the corrections described may be very small, with limited experimental consequences, they can have dramatic consequences for black holes information. Referring to the fact that this would solve the paradox that Hawking pointed out. So of course, the theorists are excited, but to me, an observer, I can't help but think, like, without observational proof, can we even declare that paradox solved yet? I don't think so. All right, that's it for Night Sky News for this month. As always, if you snap any pictures of the night sky or you see any space-related news stories that you want explained, send them my way over on social media. If you want even more space news chat, don't forget to check out the Royal Astronomical Society's super massive podcast, which I also co-host with Izzy Clark. I'll link that in the video description down below if you're interested. I'll be back with another Night Sky News next month, but until then, happy stargazing. Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to this week's video sponsor, Wondrium. Now, you've heard me talk about The Great Courses Plus before on this channel, where well, the people behind The Great Courses Plus are working to create an even better and broader educational content with Wondrium, where you can find all The Great Courses Plus content you know and love and more. Wondrium has a carefully created collection of short and long form videos, anything from documentaries to tutorials to travel logs, all presented by experts, that you know anything you find on Wondrium is going to be well-researched and academically comprehensive and, of course, entertaining too. The idea is that you can find anything that you've ever wondered about on Wondrium. So those who have been here a while and know me know that if I hadn't become an astrophysicist, I would have become a marine biologist because I'm also obsessed with dolphins and how intelligent they are. So I absolutely love this episode on animal intelligence and specifically how we measure animal intelligence from a zoology series presented by zoologists at the Smithsonian's National Zoo. And I learned that measuring this is so difficult because animals often react to human behavior when being tested. But that also in itself is emotional intelligence from the animal as well. And I was just watching this and I was just like, oh, I couldn't, my mind was just blown, basically. So if you also want to get stuck into all the content on Wondrium, head to wondrium.com forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on the link in the video description down below and you can start your free trial today. So thank you so much to Wondering for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. But wherever you are in the world right now, around, 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 around about, will give you a better resolution than Hubble at comparable wavelengths. But in the infrared, infrared, battery is running out. Let's replace it before it goes. La, 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 la. So if a star collapse is made of pure hydrogen versus one that's got some carbogen, carbogen? <laughs> that's a new word.